けか。うーん、厄介じゃのう。What's going on guys, Sasuke the Savage here, and today I'm going to be reviewing Hunter x Hunter, chapter 389. Now before I start talking about the chapter, I want to say two things. First, I may sound a little off during this video, and that's because the cold weather finally kicked in in Florida. I don't know what took so long, but since it's cold, I am not equipped to deal with that, so I have a little bit of a sore throat, and yeah, that, that's how it is, so... If I sound weird, you know the reason. Second thing I want to do is address the fandom because you had people in the community complaining about other people complaining because, of course, last chapter, we had the crazy amount of text. And in this chapter, I felt it was even worse. <laughs> it was even worse. I don't know if this chapter reached the same word count as last chapter. I'm not sure, but trust me. It was a lot worse in this chapter. But going back to the community, there were people in this fandom insulting others just because they didn't want to read all that shit. And I'm here to say those people had the right to complain because there were some panels with no art and just text. At the end of the day, people are going to have their opinions, but I just felt like the criticism, especially last chapter, was valid. Now getting into the chapter, first we start off with Prince Benjamin's side. We have Prince Benjamin, Balsam Milko, and if you don't know, that's Benjamin's head bodyguard. And we have Kanji Do, who is assigned to the Seventh Prince currently, talking about the events surrounding Shikaku's death. Since Kanji Do is assigned to the Seventh Prince, he was in the room when Shikaku killed himself, so he's trying to give his take on why Shikaku killed himself in the first place. Kanji Do comes to the conclusion that Shikaku committed suicide due to him having a bargain with the Ninth Prince Hawking Bird. Which basically means that he believes that Hawking Bird had Benjamin hostage. And after Kanji Do is done explaining his thoughts on the matter, that's when Benjamin, but mainly Balsam Milko, starts poking holes in his theory. First, if Hawking Bird did have Benjamin's life in his hands, if he were just able to shoot him with the arrow and end it, he would have to shoot through the 11th and 13th Prince's room just to get to him, and that doesn't fit Hawking Bird's nature. The second thing is, why would he make Shikaku kill himself rather than have him assassinate someone else? The third thing is the rule that's in place with the secession war. Princes can't kill other princes, at least directly, and the same goes for their nimbies. So there is a lot of doubt that Hawking Bird could have Prince Benjamin hostage with his arrows. And one of the cool things about Hunter x Hunter is Balsam Milko is completely shitting on Kanji Do's theory. And just looking at Kanji Do, you wouldn't think that this dude is intelligent, but he's pretty damn smart. Now, I think he's not that smart compared to Benjamin's other bodyguards, but if this dude was in another verse, he would be a genius probably. It's crazy because the base level of being smart in Hunter x Hunter is pretty damn high compared to other shows. Think about a character like Uvogan, who a lot of people see him as a meathead, but even that dude had a lot of brains. Now, while Balsam Milko was shitting on Kanji Do, he said something pretty interesting, and I'm gonna read it verbatim. In the battle of manipulators, the first to strike wins. When an assassin activates his ability, he would target himself. This would defend against any opponent's manipulator attacks. I found that information interesting because that got me wondering, what would happen if someone like Shao Nart and Illumi fought, Illumi tries to use his needles on Shalnark, but Shalnark is already an autopilot. Would it work then? Probably not, based on what Balsam Milko said. So because we have a character like Rihan, who isn't really suited to combat against a potential manipulator ability, Balsam Milko is reluctant to assign him to the Ninth Prince Hawking Bird. So Balsam Milko gets to the main question that I think I asked in chapter 386, but the question still remains, why do it in front of the Seventh Prince's room? And that's why would Shikaku commit suicide in front of the Seventh Prince's room? So to answer this question, Balsam Milko sends Kanji Do to gather more information on the circumstances 
around the time of Shikaku's death. And after Benjamin and Balsam Milko are left alone right on cue at 11.30 a.m., that is when the fourth rumbling occurs. And just like Kurapika, Benjamin notes that the rumblings are happening in shorter intervals. We hear on the radio that one of Benjamin's bodyguards, Vito, is struggling with Hulking Bird and he might have been possessed. Or I should just say, shot by Hawking Bird's arrow. We see with Benjamin's ability that Shikaku is dead, but not Vito. So this rules out the first theory of Hawking Bird trying to explain how his abilities work. If we assume that Vito did get hit by one of Hawking Bird's arrows, that means when Hawking Bird shoots someone with his arrow, then they're still going to be alive somewhere. So because of the rising threat of Hawking Bird, Benjamin wants to switch his surveillance off of Camilla and instead go to Hawking Bird. Balsa Milko is like, nah nigga, we are not doing that because we don't know anything about Camilla's nan abilities, so let's just stay on her. However, Balsa Milko has a genius plan to deal with Ninth Prince Hawking Bird. 911, what's the nature of your emergency? Just snitch on him. Literally, that's what Balsam Milko did. He told the boys on Hawking Bird so that he can separate Hawking Bird from his guards, which is pretty smart, but it's like, damn, you snitched on cuz. Now, Balsam Milko already believes that Hawking Bird is going to be free from this trial. He's going to be let go, just like how Camilla was let go, but he sees this as an opportunity to take him out. Moving on to the Six Princes room, we have Giuliano, who's a hunter, and it seems like he's pretty into the book written by Tyson. Not only that, it seems like the more he reads of this book, the more infatuated he is with Tyson herself. And I'm not really sure, but I think Giuliano wasn't all into Tyson's teachings before. I think he was with Izunavi when they were thinking that, hey, this is a load of BS, like what is all of this? But now it seems like he's all on board for it. And also, am I the only one who thought that Giuliano was gonna get shot when they came with that surprise cake, like I thought he was done. But that's how Tyson's Nan Beast works. The more you read of her teachings, the more you buy into it, the happier you will be. However, there's still that ominous condition that if you break a taboo, something very, very bad will happen to you. We still don't know what that taboo is, but I'm pretty sure we will find out soon if we don't go on hiatus. And the more I look at Tyson's group, the more they look like a cult to me, although it's very minor, Tyson is convincing them to do what she wants and I'm pretty sure she's going to start upping the ante. I mean, for now, it seems like Tyson isn't taking this obsession war serious. She's just dicking around or pussyfooting around. I'm not sure how that works. This bitch has hearts instead of zeros on her number plate. So you know she's a little extra. Thank God Izunavi isn't getting caught up in all of this. Now moving on to the seventh princess room. I know this happened way earlier in the chapter, but Tagashi added that Lazarus was smoking. And for some reason, he put the detail in there that it was legal what he was smoking, as if it mattered. So I think the message from Tagashi is that if you gotta smoke, smoke it legally. Kaji Dole is doing what Balsam Milko told him to, and that is to find information concerning Shikaku's death. Unfortunately, the people that Kaji Dole are talking to aren't like Balsamiko in that they aren't snitches, so they don't say shit. Kaji Dole comes up with another hypothesis. This time he's thinking that Hulking Bird had Shikaku kill himself as some type of diversion while somebody in the Seventh Prince's room is acting so that they can kill the Seventh Prince Lazarus. He suspects these two guys because they're associated with Queen Duazu. And if you don't know, Queen Duazu is the mother of Camilla, Hawking Bird, Lazarus, and I think Tubepa. But his hypothesis is shattered once again when Basho rolls up on him and is like, yo, that's not really how Queen Duazu operates. She's more of a person who stays out of things. She stays inactive in most cases. Pretty much Basho makes Kanji Dole think that he's on his side, but in actuality, Basho suspects that the first prince had something to do with Shikaku's death. Basho believes that Benjamin had Shikaku kill himself first to activate some type of Ned curse and second to frame Hawking Bird for the murder. And it's ironic because we as readers know that Basho is wrong in his thinking, but we can respect his thought process because from a hunter's perspective, it makes sense. And now we move on to the second prince, 
Camilla. I'm not even going to touch upon the afterlife companion bit that Tagashi wrote because I don't think that bat story is important. However, what I do think is important is that Camilla has harbored, gave these people land, gave these people status, these people who were known as untouchables. These untouchables are born with low power and low status, but because Camilla brought them out of that, they see her kind of as a savior. So just like Benjamin's bodyguards, Camilla's bodyguards are fiercely loyal to her. In fact, the sole purpose of Camilla's bodyguards is to curse other princes. The way these curses work, you basically have to obsess over your target. So if I wanted to kill, let's say, Prince Tyson, I would want to have a picture of her, look at the picture every day, lick the picture every day, and curse her every single day. With these curses, there are no half measures. You can't go into it half-baked. You have to be fully determined, and you literally have to give up your life for this thing to work. The closer you are to your target, the more effective it is. And with NIMBYs who are equally determined to protect their respective princes, you have to make sure you make contact with the prince, look them in their eyes as you kill yourself and make sure they're looking at you as you do it. Like this is some crazy off the wall shit, but this is coming from Camilla's camp, so I'm not surprised. And Tagashi, Tagashi, Tagashi. You introduce like 20 characters in this fucking chapter. So no, I'm not <laughs> no, I'm not going to remember all these characters. The only character I remember from Camilla's camp is the angry dyke lady who is like the leader of all the bodyguards, and her name was Sarahel. You also have the head of the servants in Camilla's camp. And she's important because she was guiding Sarahel into what she should be doing. Now, as I said before, Camilla's bodyguards live to kill the other princes with curses, so they are bound to die. So as for the other people who already have princes that are dead, for example, Momose or Sale Sale, their job is to basically scout the other princes and make sure they don't have any nan exorcists. Speaking of that, Camilla has her own Nen Exorcist, which is pretty useful as Crollo. Now, I'm not going to lie. Seeing Camilla's camp boosted her rankings and who I think will win the Secession War. However, the problem with her bodyguards is that they have nothing to lose. So they will be determined to die on sight. I know some people see this as a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. For example... One of her bodyguards is supposed to curse Kacho. Uh, yeah, let's see how that works out. And lastly, we move on to the third prince, Zayn Lei. Not really much here. Zayn Lei's bodyguard tells him how the classes with Karapika have been going. And that's when he gives him this number one coin. One of Benjamin's bodyguards who's watching over Zayn Lei, Kavin Toba, I think that's his name. He's like, yo... I had the number one coin, what the fuck? But he looks at it and it's number 10. So something happened. So Zayn Lay's name beast is a mystery and I'm not going to speculate what the fuck it does. Sorry. And that is it for the chapter. I want to say I thought this chapter was much better than the last chapter. I still have my gripes with the text. Yes, folks, I can read the shit, but I don't think it's necessary all the time. I thought the dialogue from people like Boss of Milko and Benjamin was good, but inner monologue from people like Kanji Do, it's like, eh. Sometimes I believe that Tagashi is too detailed in some of the backstory and some of the dialogue and some of the inner monologue, and it takes away from the chapter because it's with characters that we normally don't really give a fuck about, let's be honest. At times we get hit with a wall of text from characters that aren't even side characters. But guys, that is enough bitching for me. If you enjoyed this review, like, comment, subscribe. Sasuke the Savage, out. Sometimes, 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 motherfucker.